Well, first of all, I want to say that when you're working with a bank like First Internet Bank or any bank that does a lot of 7A business buying lending, don't treat that bank like they're your adversary, right? Your interests are aligned. If the bank discovers something and says, hey, we got a problem here with customer concentration, it's not the bank's problem. It's your problem as a buyer. Welcome to the Before You Buy or Sell a Business podcast, where we help buyers and sellers learn more about the acquisition process discuss recent transactions, and stay up to date on the latest news in the market. Here's your host, Jared Johnson. Okay, so we get a lot of people asking uh, legal questions or if they even need an attorney. So today I'm really excited. We got Eric from SMB Law. How are you doing, Eric? I'm good, Jared. Thanks for having me. Of course. Yeah, so maybe we can just kind of start with your background, give us an idea of uh, where you grew up, where you went to school, you know, all that fun stuff, where, where you kind of started your career in law, and we can go from there. Yeah, I'll give you the short version. I uh, grew up in the great state of Michigan, uh, Midwestern guy at heart, uh, now live in central Florida. It's kind of split the difference between Michigan and Florida. Um, but I uh, went to school at Duke University in um, North Carolina where I studied law and then worked for several large law firms, um, including most recently Kirkland and Ellis, also Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher, some of the top firms in the country, um, doing corporate transactions, mergers and acquisitions, capital markets, public company work type, type, uh, you know, typical big law corporate transactions. Um, and then two years ago in 2022, we started SMB law group with small and medium sized business focus, um, and have been working on main street transactions ever since. Awesome. Yeah. I think it'd be kind of safe to say you're one of the leaders in working on some of the SMB, you know, M and a transactions for law. I know, you know, in the last four or five years, it's really kind of caught fire, but I don't feel like there was really a law firm or people that kind of worked specifically in that, or at least maybe they weren't as popular or have as much of a presence as you. So maybe you could kind of explain uh, quickly, you know, the difference between publicly traded or large M&A and SMB M&A. Yeah. Well, and thank you for your, your comments on our firm. We're super proud of what we've built. Last year we did, just for the audience benefit, we did about $950 million in small business M&A in our first calendar year, which um, is a lot of transactions. And uh, the vast majority of it, probably 90% of our deal work is buy side small business M&A. So folks acquiring 2 to $15 million enterprise value businesses, but we will work on transactions up to $50 million. And then some smaller transactions, we have a, a, a different product for kind of the main street, true main street sub-million dollar category. So what's the difference? So I worked on large public, you know, um, public Wall Street Journal type transactions in my prior life in big law. The, the nuts and bolts of the deals aren't that different, right? M&A is M&A. You're buying assets or you're buying stock. It's really not that. The, the level of complexity, obviously, is significantly less on Main Street. Uh, the biggest difference is the players involved, right? Up market, even mid market, you know, fifty million dollar deals. You're dealing with entities. You're dealing with sophisticated people who've done lots of M and A. Down here on Main Street, you know, we've got a wide cast of characters. Some folks are M and A experienced, but many of them, particularly the sellers, are not. It'll be the only time in their lifetime that they've done a transaction. So, we've gone from highly technical legal to being much more of a hybrid between legal and business, where we have to be a lot more thoughtful about how we approach legal elements of transactions and the clients. The market for SMB buying or small small business buying has been very clear. It's like, listen, we don't want lawyers dying on hills. We don't want lawyers running big bills. We don't want lawyers fighting tooth and nail. You know, the seller, he's a father of three. He's been running his business or she for 20, 30 years. They've put their kids through college off of it. Now they're selling their life's work. They're worried about their clients, their customers, their suppliers, the community. The last thing they want is a really intense and aggressive attorney to come in and be negotiating tooth and nail over indemnity terms and dying on hills and that kind of thing. So we have to serve a much more practical and pragmatic kind of business advisor slash legal role in these deals. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, I know one of the kind of biggest challenges that uh, a lot of people deal with is when either one side of the transaction either doesn't have legal representation or they're not competent in M&A. So maybe you could just kind of touch on that and why it's very important to completely understand the M&A side. 
We see that in almost every deal, Jared, particularly on the sell side, where the counterparty's attorney is either a very good M and A attorney, you know, built for fifty hundred million dollar deals, and then you have all the issues I just talked about a second ago, or they don't know M and A at all. It's very rare that you find somebody who wants to do a two to fifteen million dollar SBA deal that really knows M and A. It's great when you do, and they do exist, but they're few and far between. So oftentimes we have seller's counsel that doesn't know M&A at all. They're not going to tell their client that. They're not going to go to their client and say, hey, Doug, you know, you probably should hire somebody else. I don't know what I'm doing. They take the work and they make it up as they go along. So you really get one of two things. You either get really bad representation where we can kind of kick their ass a little bit candidly. And, you know, my I'm not an aggressive lawyer like I described, but, you know, got to protect my buyers. And if they're going to you know, allow us to max out contractual protections and do everything we can to really give our buyers robust remedies if there are issues after closing, we're going to take it. Um, or you get them that they ask for crazy stuff that's completely off market. They strip out all the reps. They don't want any survival for anything post-closing. They try to completely hamstring your ability to recover against the seller at all. And I feel like there's many occasions where I have to go to my client and go, listen, if you do, if you go do 50 more deals, 49 of those deals are going to have better terms than what they're asking you to, to accept in this transaction right now. So it's a little bit of a frustrating thing because you're never quite sure what you're going to get. Lawyers also have really big egos. So, you know, we've done, you know, billions of dollars of small business m and I'm 37 years old. Last thing, 65-year-old Randy, who's been doing it for 30 years, wants to hear from me is, hey, you know, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but you don't know what you're doing. Um, you know, so I, you have to be very diplomatic about it. But we we run into, but I would say 60 to 70 percent of the time, it's the former. You know, we, we're in a situation where we're able to really benefit from the fact that the seller goes out, not take advantage, but benefit contractually from the from the fact that the seller doesn't hire the right person. Yeah, didn't even think about it that way. It definitely makes sense, though. So got a couple of questions that uh, people have kind of sent over to me to say, hey, if I could actually ask somebody that understands this from a legal standpoint, here's some of the questions. Um, cool. Kind of start off with maybe just a, a little bit of advice. But if there was three things that a buyer or seller uh, should really focus on in a transaction from a legal standpoint or have a good experienced attorney help them with, what, what would you say those things were? Three things. Well, the the biggest thing, the three biggest contractual terms are the indemnity, the non compete, and then I'd say, well, let's just let, we'll focus on those two first, and then probably a grab bag for the rest. But you know, indemnification is going to be the most important thing in the deal for you as a buyer. It's your contractual dispute resolution mechanism. It's the only thing that's really going to save you after closing if there are issues. The, the high level overview of what indemnity is, is, is it's a contractual dispute resolution mechanism that's built in to provide you with remedies if the seller does one of a couple things or if there are one of a couple issues with the business after closing. The first is the seller is going to make a set of representations about the business. Um, those reps are going to be everything from the fact that they actually own the business, you know, really core fundamental pieces of the business, um, all the way to, you know, less important stuff. Like, do they, you know, do they know that employees are going to leave, um, contracts? Are they all effective? You know, a variety of things, environmental benefits, tax. Um, and to the extent that they make statements in those reps and those reps turn out to not be true after closing, you then can utilize your indemnification provision to potentially recover some of the value that you lost as a buyer. And those reps, they, you know, it gets negotiated, but they're, they're, not all of them survive for the same amount of time. Like, you know, obviously the fact that they own the business at all is a fundamental rep that should survive for a very long time. If it turns out Aunt Sally comes out of the woodwork and she owns 25% of the business and says, hey, Jared, you know, I know you think you bought this business, but I actually own 25% of it. You should be able to recover for that for a long time and uncapped. Less important things, you know, are going to have shorter survival periods, 12 to 24 months and lower caps on them to give the seller some finality. But why the reps are really important is that you go to buy a small business, you can diligence it until the, the cows come home. Uh, you're never going to turn over all the skeletons in the closet. You're, you're also going to make the seller crazy in the process. So they don't want you to even try to do that. So we ask them to make a bunch of statements. That's really important. Covenants. There are a number of things that we ask them to do or not do as a seller in the transaction. The most important covenant is the non-compete. Um, that one is, you know, effectively you're agreeing to not compete in this certain type of business 
within this certain geography for a period of time. If they breach that, then you also can utilize the indemnity provision to, to potentially recover. Um, and then it covers off fraud and a, a number of other things. You can have specific line item indemnities if there are known issues with the business. But why indemnification is, is important is it's going to create the pathway for you to recover. Now, having those claims, let's say they, you know, Aunt Sally comes out of the woodwork, she owns 25% of the business. Um, and you say, okay, great, I've got an indemnity claim. Now what? Do you go back to the seller and say, hey, that 25% of the cash I paid you, you got to give back to me? That's not going to go well, right? Mr. Seller is going to probably fight you on it at best. And at worst, they're not going to have the money. So you ha also have to bake in ways to automatically recover. The, the best way in SBA or the, the market practice is to have a promissory note in place, a seller carry, and then to simply offset against that seller note to recover. So that's really important. The non-compete, which I just mentioned a second ago, is also very important. One of the biggest issues we see in these deals is the seller sells the business and then six months later, you know, they sell the ice cream business and six months later they want to, you know, operate a frozen yogurt business. Um, and they're trying to take your customers, they're trying to take your employees, your suppliers, uh, creates a big mess. We see that way too often. So making sure you've got a really strong non-compete in place is, is important. And then from there, I mean, the, the most important things that I, you want to get right is a, is a buyer is having a really strong letter of intent up front. So you've got really strong terms to stand on in your negotiation. Um, and then making sure the rest of those deal provisions are, are really tight and, um, and broad. Awesome. Yeah. I'm sure we could go on for two hours about everything that they try to do to cover themselves. Um, so, you know, you've covered quite a bit already as far as kind of what your firm does or what you do as an attorney. One of the biggest things I get as far as some pushback is often the cost involved. So could you give us kind of a, just a, a rough outline of what's normally covered and kind of what the cost is for, for your firm and then what you've even seen maybe from some other, some other sides, maybe a sell side or another buy side attorney? Yeah, legal costs can vary widely. Um, we kind of fall somewhere, we, I like to think we fall in the sweet spot where we're not the least expensive legal counsel out there. There are plenty of, you know, I'm not going to say they're all bad necessarily, but there are plenty of lawyers that will take your work and they'll do it for a nickel. Um, you probably don't want that when you're making probably the most important investment of your lifetime, but obviously I'm biased, so you, you get that. Um, you can also go find really expensive lawyers that are going to over lawyer your deal. They're going to have multiple attorneys. I'm dealing with one right now where every time I get on a call, it's me. And then the, the, on the other side, there's like four attorneys on the call. They're all billing by the hour, keeping the, the billable hour going. When we started our firm, we were pretty firmly entrenched in the, the social media entrepreneurship community, but also the, the, the ETA, the entrepreneurship through acquisition community through the elite schools that have these conferences. And so we went out and we said, what do you guys want from legal counsel? You know, do you want a billable hour? Do you like it? About 10% of people said that they're fine with the billable hour, that it's efficient, they've got good relationships with their lawyers and that they, they're okay with it. Everybody else said that they feel like a billable hour is kind of like writing a blank check um, and they would prefer to, you know, to be able to budget and have a fixed fee. Because we do, we do so much of the same work and I was just having this conversation with a buddy of mine who runs kind of a generalized corporate practice. You know, they do so much of a variety of things that it's really hard for them to say, hey, I'm going to put a flat fee on your deal because you just don't know all of the contours and you don't want to, you know. But for us, because we do so much buy side small business M&A, we've got a pretty good handle on, you know, the different components of it. So we try to take a holistic approach and we look at each element of the deal, which really is diligence, documentation, the lending process. If you use a good lender like First Internet Bank, you know, we're going to look at that and go, okay, they're going to be less of a pain in the butt to deal with. So that's going to mean less time. Holding company structuring, you know, is there, a, is there investors? Is there an entity that needs to be created, multiple entities? And we look at that holistically and say, we say, how much time do we think this would take on an hourly basis? We, we ascribe a value to it. We fix it in. And then we structure it so that we try to protect against busted deal fees to the extent possible. It's not completely every case possible to eliminate all busted deal fees, but we try to do as good of a job as possible to make sure that you mitigate the risk. So if you're a legal consumer, just know that when you go out there and you talk to multiple different attorneys that are all you know, trying to win your M&A business, they come in different shapes, sizes, different models. You can push them on things too. You can say, hey, you know, put a button. If they're going to bill by the hour, like put a cap on that. But 
you know, then what happens when you hit the cap and you still have three weeks to go for it in your transaction, you're going to finish it yourself. And so I, I really like the flat fee model. I think it works extremely well. I think the, the market has responded extremely well to it as well. In terms of what does it actually cost? You know, it really depends. I, I like to just say, hey, as a rule of thumb, if you're doing a standard asset deal um, with a promissory note, you're using First Internet Bank, no investors, you know, think like 1% of enterprise value, maybe as a proxy for how much it'll be, but you know, three to $7 million range, that probably works. Um, north of 7 million, that's probably too high. South of 3 million, it's probably too low. So you know, when you have a transaction, whether it's us or anybody else, just take it to your legal counsel and say, and if they do a lot of M&A, they should probably be able to give you a good sense of, of what it's going to cost. But I mean, just to summarize, it could be anything when you're hiring a lawyer from a few thousand dollars for poor representation to several hundred thousand dollars. I mean, I've seen small business deals with, you know, in the in the traditional space with, you know, 750, 600, 750 in legal fees for a $10 million deal. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I think the highest I've seen combined between the two was like 287 or something. And it was like a $7 million transaction. And it was mainly just the two kind of fighting with each other and redoing everything over and over and over. And I'm like, you guys are crazy, you know, just just kept rolling. So I get it why some people are a little nervous uh, to even hire somebody. But I guess if you're spending 20 to 40,000 on, you know, a $5 million transaction, I guess what you should really think about is long term, if you do it wrong, what could that cost you? A lot more than 40, 50 grand, right? So um, yeah. there, there's definitely yeah. an advantage there to, to doing well, it the and, right way. And <clears throat> good legal counsel, if it's done the right way, will build you know multi million dollar levers into your transaction that hopefully you never have to pull them post closing. But if you do, you're going to be damn sure. You know, very happy that um, that they're there. One of the funniest things that we run into, Jared, is now that we're a flat fee shop, you know, we get those lawyers on the other side that want to build the hell out of the transaction, and they run into a brick wall with us where we're like, listen, we're not going to do this. So let's find a more efficient way. But you know, you got hourly billing attorneys on both sides. You know, as soon as those markups come back, you're almost happy that they're being difficult because show me yeah. how somebody makes money, and I'll I'll tell you how they're going to behave. Um, and yeah. it's, you know, bad incentives. Definitely makes sense. Yeah. Just get to the point and get it done. Right. So shifting gears a little bit, uh, lately, um, kind of in the SMB M and a space, what have you been seeing as far as kind of the, maybe one or two major reasons that deals have been blowing up? The biggest one is renegotiation coming out of quality of earnings. Um, you know, people are finding a lot of issues with, uh, seller financials and having to renegotiate those, those negotiations typically go well, like more often than not, if you go to the seller and you say, Hey, you know, you, you thought it was worth this, but it's not. Um, usually they're receptive to it. If there's a really good reason, they don't have to be receptive to it, but we see a lot of issues, um, coming out of that. And then, you know, there's just a lot of anxiety, I think on the sell side, we see a ton of that down the stretch. I have a deal right now where it's two partners that are selling. The one is the operating partner. He's been running this business for a long time. He really wants to sell. He's in his 60s. He's tired. His partner is a young guy whose father financed the business 20 years ago. Owns 50% of the cash flow, does 0% of the work. He is actively trying to derail the transaction, it feels like, at the, the finish line. Um, that's not super uncommon, you know, to have a group of sellers that are not on the same page down the stretch. Um, and so quality of earnings is definitely the biggest one. So that's a plug. Go hire a good quality of earnings provider. The biggest issue I've seen in, in, in these deals, Jared, or one of the biggest issues is the smartest clients that I have, the ones that have spent a decade at Goldman Sachs, and now they want to financially diligence a pool services company. You know, it's a different animal and you got so much going on in the transaction you're dealing with. First, you're talking to First Internet Bank, you're trying to get your financing. They're giving you a big checklist. You're worried running the legal process. You're trying to financially diligence the business. You got kids and a spouse and, you know, a job sometimes to work as well. It's too much. So go hire, it'll be worth every penny to hire a quality of earnings provider who will financially diligence your, your deal. And in the end, you know, they may find something that either is a reason to get out, which is a good outcome, in my opinion, or a better outcome, obviously, than closing. 
um, or they may find a, a way to potentially reduce that purchase price in a warranted way. So, Yeah, I've even seen lately it go the other way where the quality of earnings actually showed that the seller was doing better than than what you know they were reporting on their tax returns or what we initially thought. And it actually kind of helps us when we're trying to figure out the cash flow and debt service coverage, they're actually doing better. So, you know, for, for a while there, quality of earnings kind of wasn't even something anybody talked about, right? It was kind of reserved for maybe some much larger transactions. And now we're starting to see it come down in, into the smaller transactions. And I'm definitely happy when they find something wrong and they're willing to either renegotiate to, to kind of bring the deal back down where it makes sense or punting um, because the last thing we want is six months in or, or even six weeks in after they buy, they're coming back saying, hey, these you know four things weren't accurate and what do we do? And we're all sitting there trying to figure it out. It costs the bank a lot of money, you know, cost buyer and seller a lot of money. It could literally ruin somebody financially. So yeah, it's it's good to see people actually doing a, a lot more of the smarter due diligence. So yeah, we're see, we're seeing it almost in almost every deal now. Yeah, yeah. Which there's is, a lot of good providers good. that are they've got a different scope for these smaller deals, and it's 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 good stuff. Yeah. So you so you brought up obviously you know some of the due diligence. So uh, with the quality of earnings, a lot of times you're also going to see kind of the percentage of sales per customer. So. Um, many times I'm seeing where it's uncovering that there is actually a concentration that maybe they didn't realize. So if you do have a, a client that uh, realizes the seller has a concentration, what's something that you can do or you could recommend that somebody do in the, in the purchase contract or maybe even with a seller carry note to kind of offset that or protect themselves against that? Well, first of all, I want to say that you, you, when you're working with a bank like First Internet Bank or any bank that does a lot of 7A business buying lending, don't treat that bank like they're your adversary, right? Your interests are aligned. If the bank discovers something and says, hey, we got a problem here with customer concentration, it's not the bank's problem. It's your problem as a buyer. And um, so it's a plug for working with someone like Jared or very seasoned 7A lender that can help identify those issues in the business. What do you do when you find them? Well, customer concentration in particular, the best way to mitigate that risk, in my opinion, is you got to ask yourself, like, number one, is the transaction even viable anymore? Is there too much risk, right? Because depending on the level of concentration, if you've got 70% of your revenue wrapped up into one, um, one client and that client goes away after closing, whether it's your fault or for nobody's fault at all, you're now out 70% of your revenue, that business is going to zero. To me, that's too, and it depends on the risk profile. If you're a buyer and you've got multiple businesses and you've got an enterprise and you're sophisticated and you want to take that risk, have at it. If you're a self-funded searcher that has a you know wife or husband and kids and this is your first acquisition, you're personally guaranteeing this with your home, that's not a risk that I would take. Um, when you get to the territory of like what level of risk is worth taking, you got to ask yourself, can we build contractual protections for that? The best way to do it is to have some sort of contingent piece of compensation in the deal. So take the promissory note and say, okay, we've got one customer who represents 25% of the revenue of the business. Can we have a uh, promissory note that represents 25% of the purchase price or whatever the mathematical equation is that creates a situation where if you lose... 25 or whatever percentage of the revenue that you can make up for that by reducing an equivalent or at least closely enough equivalent percentage of the debt service to still put yourself in a viable position. This market too is becoming much more accommodating to larger seller notes because interest rates have risen. It's more challenging to underwrite these deals. And so don't be afraid if you've got material issues in the business. And remember that these issues are not your problem, it's the seller's problem. And when the seller takes a business to market that has 50% customer concentration, they're going to have a business that has either a major valuation problem or is not saleable at all. So you're coming to them, you don't have to walk on eggshells about finding a solution to their problem so that you can have a win-win, which is you get to buy their business, they get to exit, but you also don't own a crazy amount of risk. But it all comes back to understanding the the philosophy and the, why these transactions are valued the way that they're valued, right? They, you're looking at past performance to try to draw a conclusion about what's going to happen in the future. If 
if that past performance turns out to not be indicative of what's going to happen in the future because 50% of the revenue actually goes away, then you've dramatically overpaid for this deal. So to me, it's, it's not a challenging explanation. Now, whether they are going to accept it or not is their prerogative. But to me, it's not a challenging explanation to go to the seller and say, hey, you were doing a million bucks in revenue, but 50% of that may go away. And if it does, then I've dramatically overpaid for this business. And so if it doesn't, you'll get paid for the million bucks. If it does, then you'll get paid what you should have got paid because that's what was going to happen in the future. Now, are they going to agree to that? It depends on if they have other buyers. Um, so, Yeah, no, you bring up a great point. And uh, I think too many people, they'll call and say, hey, how do you feel about concentrations? I'm usually like, well, that's a pretty broad question. So let's get into it. How long have they been a customer? You know, what percentage do they make up? Is there a contract involved? You know, how tight is the seller and, you know, that customer? And there's a lot to kind of talk through that. Um, and then, like you said, there's there's obviously ways to protect yourself. Um, and a lot of times it's just smarter to, to move on, especially if they don't have any kind of experience in that industry. Um, there's There's a pretty high likelihood that they're going to walk in there and, you know, maybe mess it up in the first couple of weeks. And if they do that and a large customer says, Hey, we don't have faith in this business anymore. And they pull the plug, then you're, you're in some big trouble. So yeah, it definitely Agreed. makes sense. Agreed. Yeah. I think that one of the messages I have for my buyers all the time is we got a wimpy group of buyers out there, Jared. The first time buyers are wimpy. They, they walk on eggshells. They feel like they've got to play nice with everything that the broker and the seller ask for. And you do want to be diplomatic. I'm not saying be, a, that's not what I'm saying. If you need to blurt, bleep that out, bleep it out, but don't be a, don't be a jerk. You don't need to be a jerk, but, but you don't need to walk on eggshells. You're risking your financial life. You're taking multi-million dollar personally guaranteed debt. You need to have a checklist of things that you need in your deal in order to execute. You need to be unemotional about it. It's very challenging after you get past LOI to be unemotional, particularly when you're like, hey, I live in the suburbs of you know, Richmond, Virginia, and I'm moving to Breckenridge, Colorado. My wife's going, when are we getting rental houses? When is this closing? Where are we putting the kids in school? And you're trying to be unemotional about it. And then the seller comes back to you at the three yard line and says, hey, wait a second, like you're, you know, you're not taking any working capital. What do you mean working capital? And they try to retrade on the purchase price by 300,000 bucks and you're trying to play nice on everything. Um, you don't have to do that. You can always pull the plug and go do another deal. Um, there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of them. Yeah. Some great advice. Uh, I feel too many people, uh, they, they feel like they're too far in or they've been searching for so long that they're like, I'll just take what I can get and, and kind of look the other way and then it ends up biting them later. So yeah, it makes sense. So, um, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but we're seeing a lot more searchers that are bringing investors into deals. Um, most of the time I feel like they're either trying to go kind of the, the normal search, you know, old school route of funding the entire deal with investors. And then they kind of go, Oh, I can do a little bit of hybrid of both and have some investors that help with the down payment um, use SBA for the difference. What are some of the kind of things that I feel like people aren't, uh, thinking about or considering when they're bringing in investors, um, and then moving forward with operating the business? Yeah. I think the biggest thing with investors is that people have a very simplistic way that they think about it. They think about, um, how much money are you giving me and what, what are you going to get in return for? And that's certainly one piece of the puzzle. That's the financial piece of it. But more important or equally important is the governance. How much control is that individual going to or individuals going to want? And then what is their objective for the business? Because not all investors are going to have the same idea about what's happening. You're buying a business, I would suspect for, you know, a lot of people are buying a business because they're saying, hey, I'm tired of corporate. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to kind of have a little bit more control. Now that's maybe, you know, people will scream and shout about how much control an entrepreneur really has. But the point being is you're saying, I don't want to have any more bosses. So you're going to bring in these individuals. What type of control are you going to give them? What veto rights are they going to have? They're going to ask for potentially a suite of veto rights that if you're going to make certain decisions in the business, sell it, bankrupt it, um, take debt, do a variety of things that they're going to be able to tell you no. So now all of a sudden you do have a boss, you know, the, what you're trying to get rid of. 
Um, and then also, too, if you've got investors that after three, four or five years, they want their capital back and they're going to be beating a drum going, you need to sell, 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 sell. Um, but you're said, but it's a permanent hold for you. Then you want to make sure that you have some sort of strategic alignment around that up front. There are mechanisms that you can build in also to give people liquidity if they do want to get out or if you do want to take them out at some point. Um, but you want to have that conversation. Now, the financial terms, you know, that's. You know, it's a little bit of the Wild West, which sounds funny to say to a man wearing a cowboy hat uh, in Dallas, Texas. Um, <laughs> but it's a little bit of a Wild Wild West in terms of terms. But in most cases, you're going to see a one and a half to two and a half times step up on the capital that's invested. So if somebody puts in a hundred grand, they're going to get somewhere between 150 grand and 250 grand credit towards the enterprise value. So if it's a million dollar EV business, they'll take 15 to 25 percent of the business. And then they'll get a preferred return somewhere between 8 to 12% on that capital. So until it's repaid, they get paid back the, on the initial 100K, 8 to 12% um, per year until they're paid back. And then thereafter, they're going to they're gonna participate peri passu or, or pro rata with, um, with you, the sponsor. So if they own 15% of the business and you distribute a dollar, they take 15 cents of that dollar. Um, it's kind of the broad stroke financial terms. Um, and then the control stuff, and you know, we see this a lot marketed in the SMB marketplace where certain investors will say, Hey, you know, you take my capital, you keep 80% of the business. And while that's true, you want to look through and say, okay, but what control rights are you going to ask for? And what is your objective for the business? And the last part is not all investors are created equally in terms of what they're going to add to the to the cap table. So, so if you can find smart money, people who could serve as strategic advisors, that's even better than just generic dollars. Yeah, it makes sense. I know there's a lot, a lot to cover when it, when it comes to that. All right. So what's like the craziest demand or request that you've gotten either from buyer, your, your client, or even from a seller? Well, I, you know, it's not, I, I don't know that I have one in particular. Every so often, I can think of two deals right now off the top of my head where you get seller's counsel that comes in and they just massacre the deal, um, meaning they strip away everything possible. We had one a few months ago where it was a, um, a business that didn't have, and this was not going to go SBA. This deal could never get through SBA, Jared. And that's what I kept trying to tell my buyer and I kept trying to explain to the seller's counsel is, who, who are you going to sell this business to if you don't sell to my buyer? Because this will never get through an SBA lender. It didn't have a lease. They wanted the seller to not personally guarantee anything. They wanted the all the reps to expire at closing. I mean, just on and on and on and on. So basically, you're buying a business, like a very technical business with no property to run it on. Uh, well, actually, the pro they had a lease, but um, the 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 property wasn't zoned for what they were using it for. So a few years earlier, the city had said, you got to stop. They didn't stop, you know, and now they want no responsibility. They sell the business. They want no responsibility for that after closing. You'll get seller, seller's counsel who will come in and they will swing for the fences. And it's frustrating because you're at that stage, 60 to 90 days into the deal. You've negotiated an LOI. You've done quality of earnings. We've drafted a purchase agreement that is, you know, very reasonable and market and is not crazy. It's 30 pages, it's not insane. Um, and then we'll get back just an absolute massacred deal. Um, and it's very frustrating. And we try to navigate through that. And sometimes you just have to walk away. Um, and we've, we've seen that a few times. It's not common, uh, fortunately, but it does happen. Yeah, that makes sense. But again, had, if the buyer doesn't have legal representation and they walk into that, they may just sign everything and not realize what they're really getting themselves into. So it definitely makes sense. Well, and what I've started to do too, Jared, is I know that credit committee for many of these SBA banks, not going to agree to this stuff. You know, you want a two-year non-compete, the bank's not going to agree to that. So I, listen, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm just going to turn around and tell the bank, hey, you know, first internet bank, are you going to agree to, you know, having a $250,000 cap on a non-compete for a $5 million acquisition? No, yeah. you're not. So exactly. I'm not even going to waste my time, seller's lawyer, arguing with you because 
the bank's going to say no to it, even if I agree to it. So what's the point? So I've been leveraging that a lot. And then what's funny is then seller's counsel goes, I've never in my 30 years, Jared, had a bank tell me what I can and can't do. And then I go, it's because you don't do SBA deals because they will in every single transaction. So a um, lot of fun. I have a lot of fun in my job. I did 40 deals last year and they were all SBA. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, you're a lot. You did a lot of yeah, that. You're a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's been uh, really informative. Uh, I really appreciate you you coming by. Ed, uh, one last question. You, you can refuse to answer it if you want. But um, if I had to put you against Scott Oliver, who would be a better attorney? Scott Oliver is an amazing attorney. I love Scott Oliver. Scott Oliver, for the audience's benefit, is a lender side counsel, represents a number of the banks. This guy out of Indiana, which is like, I'm from Michigan. He's, he's, we're cut from the same cloth. So I love the dude. Um, and he's a really good lawyer, man. He's, he, do, he does a good job for the banks. And that's, it's the beauty of, as an attorney, I want to be opposite of a good lawyer, Jared, that knows the transactions, that knows what they're doing. Because when you got two good lawyers on the, the other side, opposite side of the deal, we're not fighting tooth and nail about this stuff. We go, hey, you know, we know the market is somewhere between a three and a seven. You're going to start out by saying three. I'm going to start out. Then I'm going to come back and say seven. So why don't we just call each other up and say, hey, dude, it's going to be a five. And let's just allow our clients to move on. And when you've got those those lawyers on both sides of the deal, and that's how Scott operates. He's very commercial. He's very pragmatic. But he he, he knows his stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly a joy to work with Scott and lawyers like him. That was, a, that was a great lawyer answer. I appreciate it. Um, you know, yeah, we, we love working with Scott too. And, and it honestly, like you were kind of saying, I mean, when we have someone like you on, you know, our borrower side, uh, and you know, Scott, you know how Scott operates, it makes the transaction so much easier to, to move forward. It's one of the big things that we kind of look at now is like, who's doing quality of earnings? Who's your attorney? Do you even have an attorney? You need to get with somebody. And then, their question is always, how long is this going to take? And it's a lot easier for us to try to determine that or at least think proactively that it's going to be faster if we have good counsel on both sides. So, yeah, we, we enjoy working on the deals when the two of you are on opposite sides because we know nobody's going to do anything stupid and we're going to be able to work through something that's challenging. So. He, he's probably looked at our form purchase agreement 50 plus times now too so yeah very good. streamlined he knows what he's going to see and it's 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 good so shout out to Scott. yeah cool awesome okay so i always ask two questions at the end first one is uh do you have a mentor or have you ever had a mentor so i've had many uh i had the good fortune in my prior life in big law of working for some of the truly the best lawyers in america one of the guys i worked for was one of five shining stars uh, of private equity M&A in the country. Fantastic guy. Most interesting thing about him is as good of a lawyer as he was, he's an even better person. Like just truly a charismatic dude that like knew everybody in town, was like wonderful to, uh, to work with, assuming you met the dress code. Um, and then, so I've had a couple of those guys uh, in, 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 uh, in big law couple people. I've got four brothers, fifth brother, fifth guy is like another brother to me. So a lot of, a lot of good guys in my life. Um, and then I have a, a, a business and life coach, uh, who's a fantastic guy. And it's like middle-aged man therapy. You know, I call him, he's like, dude, you gotta get to the gym. I'm like, yeah, gotta get to the gym. So, um, it's, it's good. I got good people in my life. I'll have to, uh, figure out who that person is. Maybe you can help me out. I probably need that as well. Sure. So. Last question, uh, you know, you've been very successful, obviously kind of been, I feel like at the forefront of, you know, kind of S&B, M&A attorneys and, and kind of blazing a trail for a lot of other people. But uh, what motivates you? You know, what, what gets you up? What keeps you pushing to be more and more successful? Yeah, we're going to extend this podcast out a while with a question like that at the very end. Um, I love these deals. I love the client, right? So when we launched the firm, my, you know, 25 to 45 year old people with a couple of kids, like that's my tribe. Um, and they're all seeking the same thing, which is a different quality of life, something different. They're entrepreneurial. Most of them are family people. That's me. And so when I was in my prior life representing big companies and private equity funds and they're doing this, it meant nothing. I mean, it was interesting work, but like it was soulless. 
now your client is, you know, a father that's got multiple kids. He's moving across the country. He's trying to buy a business. He's been in corporate for a decade. He's tired, but he's also excited about a new challenge and he wants to build something for his kids. Like I'll talk to that dude at three in the morning. Like I love it. I am obsessed with business buying. That's why I tweet nearly constantly about business buying. Um, I got to have an outlet. The transactions are interesting too. The, you're taking down a business. The financial rewards, if you get it right, are there's no better investment than this if you get it right. If you get it wrong, it is a big problem in your life. Great country to start over. So it's not always, you know, shout out to some of my clients who've had issues. But um, the, I love these transactions. I truly love the work. And what I've found in my life is when you've got passion for something, true passion for it, you're good at it and you can make money doing it, find the center of those three things and it's magic. And I really think that throughout our firm, why we've had the success that we've had is we found a large group of people who all have the same ethos. They really care about the clients. They're really good at what they do. They've all went to top law schools and worked at top firms um, and they're excited. Um, And I think that that, really resonates with people. Um, and so it's been fun. It's been really fun. Yeah, no, I, I, I can see that. I mean, anytime you're, you're kind of self-motivated because you really enjoy what you do, you, it, it comes out, you know, you'll continue to get better and better at it. So, all right. So where, where can people find you? Uh, well, you can find us where SMB Law Group, smblaw.group is our URL. I'm on Twitter at S, uh, at SMB underscore attorney. Um, and then LinkedIn, my name's Eric Pasifich. will be in the show notes, I'm sure. Um, so happy to chat anytime. If anybody out there wants to talk about business buying or business buying legal, I'd love to connect. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for coming by. I'm sure we'll, uh, talk on a couple of transactions soon and look forward to seeing you around. For sure. Thanks for having me, Jared. Of course. Thank you for listening. We hope you found this podcast informative and helpful. Please don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. For more information, or if you'd like to discuss a transaction, please go to www.jaredwjohnson.com.